Um, the next question Excellent. we will uh, direct uh, to Corinna. Welcome here today, Corinna. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have it here on papers because uh, I think my English is not that great uh, and I want to have it ready in papers. Uh, first of all, I want to, to say to Tom, thank you very much. Uh, you were very right. Uh, I feel like crying. Uh, thank you. My life totally changed. Uh, LCS is giving me gifts. <laughs> Uh, and I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's really great though because first time in my life I feel happy. Good. Yeah. Uh, first time uh, I don't need to depend on external factors in order to feel happiness, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, my first question is uh, about the confusion that I still have on that, because I'm trying to understand how it works. Uh, you know that I was doing research on subconscious uh, reprogramming, uh, removing limiting beliefs and all that kind of things. So, I was used to the idea that anything we experience is a result of those limiting beliefs. So I was used to take on me 100% of the responsibility for, the, for whatever I was experiencing. It was always uh, my fault with the sense that I, uh, I create my reality after my limiting beliefs. So I have seen from my patients and clients that if I help them change a limiting belief, then all the people around them uh, would change behavior just by changing even one limiting belief. Uh, but this was not happening with me, and I want to give you an example. Um, you know, I was a very abused child, and my mother was always saying to me, don't be sad that your father is beating you. He does it because he loves you very much. So my subconscious had the belief, whoever loves me will behave badly to me. Uh, when I discovered this belief, I started, I started to take again 100% responsibility of how others behave to me. And I was always trying to change myself and to try to change my subconscious. And I was doing anything that you can imagine in order to reprogram my subconscious mind. Um, and at the same time, to show more and more love to that people. So I was becoming a victim. Um, when I asked your advice, uh, and I had to realize that there's nothing wrong, and I say the whole story uh, in order for people to understand how, uh, why I have this confusion. Uh, when I asked your advice and uh, I realized that there's nothing wrong with me, but it's them, it was hard for me and painful to realize that, and I couldn't move away easily from the other people, as you know. Uh, but every time I was living one neurotic person, LCS, was becoming Santa Claus and was giving me uh, great gifts, you know, and surprises. And uh, every time, I, I mean, I was doing it as a test, you know, because you said, even if I was doing it as a test, because you said, at least try. So uh, I, I tried, okay. It was, even if it was a test that I was doing, it was scary for me, but I did it anyway. So every time that I was throwing away an erotic person, I immediately I should gift. From LCS. That's how I, I feel it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what is going on? So, you were right, okay? I'm convinced you were right. Uh, and I'm extremely grateful. But what is going on with our limiting beliefs? They don't really okay. create our reality. Uh, one, I, I have met two, three more on this. Uh, I mean, I have removed this limiting belief from me for years. And from other peoples, for other peoples, it's what was working, for me not. Uh, now, without doing any new removal techniques, uh, just following the I'm leaving the wrong people. Uh, so what, the theory that I use to help people is right, it's half right, half wrong, 
and how much limiting beliefs affect us and how we can know until which point is our limiting beliefs the problem is our responsibility um, and at which point is then how we understand okay. this sure you what you've just come to learn is that you don't create your own reality 100 percent you can modify what your what your reality is but you don't create all of it you're not responsible for all of it everybody else here also has a free will and they are making choices based on whatever level of quality they've grown to this point and they have to make those free will choices these people interact with you you have to deal with them you are not responsible for what they do you see so yes you can change your reality and you are responsible for it for certain ways one way that you make your own reality is that you interpret the information you get you'll get information and you will interpret that in terms of your own beliefs your own knowledge your own experience your own quality and that's how you interpret the information and you are solely responsible for that interpretation of the data you get that's yours you have to own it okay another way that you can modify your reality <clears throat> is that you can you have an intent and your intentions tend to modify future probability but they don't force future probability they only modify it so there's some some things that your intent just aren't going to change if there is a if there is a let's say uh, one thing has a possibility of one in a hundred thousand of being of of happening of being part of your reality okay and you put a lot, and let's say that's somebody that uh, is mean to you, being nice to you. It may have a, a one in a hundred thousand of actually happening, that they would be nice to you. Okay. And you can work with that with an intent and say, I will give them love. I will give them care. And I will give a very positive intent to that person. And you may change that from one in you know a hundred thousand to just one in a thousand. Well, that's amazing. You've just, you know, made it a hundred times more po more probable but it still isn't likely to happen you see it's still one in a hundred or one in a thousand so you don't you can't force reality to be the way you want it you can only nudge it you can only move it as much as it will move you don't get to create everything you want with your intent you only get to nudge those things that you can nudge so those are the two big ways that you create your own reality. One is your interpretation and two with your intent, but both, you know, have their limitations. Your intent can only change reality so much. And it depends on the kind of energy you can give to it. It depends on the strength of your intent and how often you have the intent. Plus it depends on how much you're trying to get that probability to change. You can only change it so much. Remember, there's somebody else on the other side with an intent as well. They have intentions. They have problems. They have low quality. They have issues. They have fear. They may have love too. But they are who they are, and they get to make their own choices, and they can modify future probabilities with their intent. So we're all here together. All of we, all of us people with free will and our intents, some are, you know, some are pulling to the right some are pulling to the left some want us to go up some want us to go down and they're all in there all these intents and what actually happens in the future is going to be the sum of all those pressures on that intent and the natural probability that that event that event just came in with so <clears throat> there is one other way that you can modify your probability and that is by how you behave how you interact with others if you interact with others in a caring way, that generally can make some of them anyway be more caring towards you. People like other people who are nice and caring. You want to be around people who are nice and caring. They like that. If you are real miserable and unhappy and a user of people, 
people won't like you. They'll move and they'll go away from you. They'll go out of their way to not be around you. So those are the three ways that you can modify your reality. But remember, you're not creating it 100%. You're just nudging it with your intent, nudging it with your behavior, and nudging it with your interpretation. You have to realize that everybody else has the same thing. They can modify their intent. And if what, let's say they are very mean people and what they intend is they want to use people. They want everybody to, you know, to give them what they want. That's their intent. Their intent is to make sure that they get everything they want and they don't mind hurting other people to do it. That's their intent. That's the way they act. Now, maybe they've learned to smile and, and be pleasant up front. Maybe not. But they have that intent. And your intent and their intent may clash sometimes. So you have to realize that everybody is responsible for themselves, but they're not responsible for the behavior of everyone else. Okay, so you're responsible for who you are, your choices, your intents, your interpretation. That's so what you're responsible for. Okay, so don't... Uh... But you you agree? Do you agree that uh, someone who has a limiting belief, for example, uh, that uh, all men are bad or violent, uh, will mm-hmm. attract more of that, right? So it is a point to to clean our limiting beliefs, uh, but also to to protect ourselves and to not become victims. Yes, that's true. Uh, you have there any belief you have is a limiting belief. There are no beliefs that aren't limiting. That's the nature of a belief is to be limit, that it limits you. Even if you believe that everybody is wonderful and everybody just wants to help you out, that is a problem. You know, that limits you. Now you just are willing to, you know, you, you're no longer, uh, taking good care of yourself because you believe everybody, you know, wants to help you out. Well, that's not true. So any belief is limiting. And it's good to get rid of those. But typically, it's fear that's the problem. So if you have a belief that creates fear, like if you see that all all men are evil or all men are out to get you or to manipulate you or to control you, then that would be a fear. And if you have that fear, then that is going to limit you because there are men that don't want to control you. There are men that don't. Uh, want to abuse you there are men who will be very nice and be good friends and you know be good mates they exist so if you have a belief that all men are are evil then you will also eliminate all the men who are not evil so then that limits you you see so you have to be cautious yes and you need not to have the belief but the problem with the belief is really the fear It's the fear that creates the belief that's the problem. If you get rid of that fear, then the belief goes away. So, yes, beliefs will limit you. But you cannot create the reality of your choice. You can only be authentic, caring, loving, cautious, make sure others, you know, don't drag you down because they have low quality of consciousness. You have all those things, and then you just have to let things happen after that. People will come and go. You'll interact with people. You'll you'll get to know people, and you have to be open to that being good. You have to be open to that not being good. So you meet somebody that you've never met before. They may be good for you. They may not be good for you. So you aren't afraid, so you find out. You have, you get to know them. You talk with them a little bit. And as you see signs that uh, they seem to be good for you, well, then talk to them a little more and make your subject matter, you know, a little wider. You see I, you, you see things that make you think that eh, they seem to be controlling. They seem to be all about them. It's It's about their needs and their wants all the time. Well, then you go on and Meet, find somebody else to talk to. You see, you have to make these choices. You can't control everything. You can't say, oh, I'll just love this person and then they'll love me. Well, 
they may not be capable of loving. People, mm-hmm. people are only as capable of loving as they are, uh, as it is that they have uh, space without fear. You see, if you're a very fearful person, that also limits how much you can give. The f- a very, very fearful person can't love but so much. So if you're very fearful, then your ability to love is much smaller. So you you need to look for people who aren't fearful, who their natural way of being is to give and to care. You don't look for somebody that, and then think that you'll turn them into something better than they are. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. You need to take them the way they are, not try to manipulate or make them into something else. So you have to be cautious and you have to be careful, but you also should be open. Using words like all, always, and never usually aren't true. There's very few things that are like that. You know, some Mm -hmm. men will be abusive. Others will not. You just need to make sure you filter for the ones that are not, you see, and don't Mm -hmm. think you will change anybody. People are the way they are. They don't change, and you can't change them. You can only change yourself. But when they say that they want to change and they want to become fearless, uh, then we give uh, give them more chance uh, and wait, uh, or we help them, or... Well, if they're serious and you think they're serious, you can wait a little and say, well, let's see how that works out. But if you don't see it happening... (laughs) then it's just wishful thinking on their part. Yes, they intellectually think they'd like to be different, but that doesn't, is a, you know, and they may even act different for a while, but it's acting. It only is going to be important if they actually do change and become different. So I'd say you look at that very tentatively because for the most part, when people make those kinds of things, oh, I'm going to be different, they're not really they're committed to acting different for a while before they slip right back into who they really are because you can only act your life for so long and then you actually have to be it. So, you know, that's tasting the pudding. Look at it and see. Is there real change there or is there just acting? If there's just acting, then that's not change at all. That doesn't mean they're ever going to change. Most people change very little. Most people don't change much. Even that's even true of, you know, of people who are who are seekers, who are trying to change themselves. Growing up is a hard thing to do. It's hard to change yourself. So if you're not a seeker, then it's even harder. If you're a seeker trying to grow up, it's still hard. Most people change their behavior and they change it for a while until they've made the impressions they want to make. And then they have to be themselves. So um, now you can't change people. Let people be who they are. Don't even try to change them. Just let them be who they are. The idea that you can make people better is usually a belief that isn't true. People are who they are. Now people can grow up and be better, but it's a rare thing that they do that very often or grow up very much not unheard of some sometimes people have breakthroughs and they grow up a whole lot real quickly but that doesn't happen very often for most of us it's just a little bit at a time and our our raising the quality of our consciousness is just one little bit at a time okay thank you um i will go to the second donna yes Can you hear me? yes um so in the last uh, Zoom meeting that uh, the group meeting that we had, I learned from you, Tom, that the lucid dreams are real, <laughs> uh, which I didn't know. Uh, and after a while, uh, something strange happened, which was like a proof for that. Uh, it's a bit uh, it's like two and a half pages very fast, I will say it. Uh, but I have to tell you the story in order to advise. It's uh, uh, one year and a half ago, I have fallen asleep with the intention to wake up after every dream and to uh, write in my dream journal. 
when I woke up, I was remembering very little. Only I was remembering one lucid dream and maybe two normal dreams. Uh, when I saw, when I looked at the dream journal, uh, I saw that uh, was there like seven pages. I have wrote, uh, written uh, seven pages of dreams. Uh, in every dream was a strange guy appearing and he was saying to me the same thing. You must go to Stonehenge. You must go to Stonehenge in every dream. Uh, and it was in all in the journal, everywhere, uh, you know, that sentence and that guy saying to me that thing. I searched on the internet all that year several times, but couldn't find and couldn't find anything about the Stonehenge thing. And when I started to change uh, things in my life, you know, to, to throw away negative people and all that, uh, lately, a few days ago, I met a guy who wanted to, to help me with the with the project because I couldn't find someone for business plan, and he said, I will do it. Uh, and when we met on camera to talk about the project, I was shocked because was that guy from the Stonehead thing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, lucid dreams are real, but that much. Uh, and the more strange thing is that uh, uh, from the beginning, uh, was like a, a connection. And uh, yes, I am an empath and I feel others, uh, but I could feel a very intense, uh, and I don't know how to turn this off if you can advise me, but, uh, very intense if he was sad or something like that, you know, so uh, I was feeling I had to do something about that. Um, so once I tried to heal him, uh, and with the way that uh, you, t- you show us in the experiential workshops, and the intention was to heal his emotional body because he had some problems and he was sad. But while while I was doing it, I felt even more his sadness, and especially uh, the lack of love. And because uh, I know how it is, this lack of love, I wanted to help, to to do something about it. Um, And I felt him like a little wounded child. So I added something in uh, in the healing method that I know from your videos, And what I added was what you told me to do with bad entities if I go out of body. Uh, That you said, uh, give a hug, uh, a kiss on the cheek, give love. So I said, why not do this extra thing also to this person that I feel has lack of love. So I do that. And when I do that, I, I think I did it too much from being level because I was feeling him very much. Um, so when I did that, uh, I suddenly had image in front of me, uh, like if I was there and the image was very blur, but I could see. And uh, I felt that uh, uh, I have to help him lie down. It was very real, like I was there uh, when I gave this hug. And I felt like he falls, he fell down. And I have to help him lie down because he turns so heavy and he's falling. And... Uh, uh, as I wanted to make him lie down, I felt it was a piece of furniture that was, uh, uh, I had to move it a bit. So I kicked that piece of furniture and I realized it had wheels because it moved uh, more far away than my little kick, you know. Uh, but when I finished with all of this, the guy wrote to me because uh, it was from far away the healing and the, from chat on Facebook. He wrote to me that he has lost consciousness while I was doing the healing and he found even his desk chair, which has wheels, moved one meter far away without him moving it. Uh, so it, it was real. What was going on? I, it was, I moved a thing and uh, it has had wheels. Uh, he was. He said he's feeling better. I, I was worried because he said he lost consciousness, but he was happy because he was feeling much better, much relieved. Uh, and since then, uh, he says all these uh, days that he laughs a lot and things that were stressing him don't stress him so much anymore. So this means what I saw was real. I actually ask this question. I, I don't care so much to explain things with uh, reason, you know, uh, but he wanted to ask this so much. Um, I think he, he was, I think all this 
think scares him a bit. Uh, so, uh, for uh, what I would like to know is, it means that what I saw was real, I was really there, but how? Uh, I mean, his chair was even moved. And how do you explain that he lost consciousness? Um, and uh, how uh, can be, for me, it's not uh, wired to have a strong connection with people, uh, but he wonders how can be explained to, to feel such strong connection with someone. Um, and uh, the most strange part is <laughs> that uh, after I told him about uh, that dreams with Stonehead, <clears throat> suddenly Google was giving results, like a Mandela effect. Before that, I couldn't find results. When I told him about the Stonehead thing, I started to find results. And guess where is Stonehead? <laughs> Is very near the castle. Where are the immersive that you're gonna do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, a little, a little <laughs> bit about a little bit about experiences. When you have experiences like that, just as sec accept them as experiences. Okay, that was your experience. That was his experience. Okay. Don't necessarily take them literally now in this case you had some confirmation that the things you saw are also the things he experienced okay what we have going on here is information you get a data stream he gets a data stream that data stream that he gets defines his reality that data stream that you get defines your reality okay now when you have a reality that seems to be uh um intertwined or working together like in this instance it's best just to accept that as face value okay that was what i saw that is what i felt don't make anything more of it just let it be that nothing more okay and when you get down to what does it mean probably not even a good question to ask just let it be and say that was my experience it doesn't necessarily mean anything, because if you meaning to it, you will do that with your own interpretation. When you do that with your interpretation, you're going to make it mean something that you would like it to mean. Or perhaps if you're very fearful, something that you would not like it to mean. So best not to interpret. Just accept it as it was. You can accept what he said as it was. And then kind of let it be. You don't have to do anything with it. Don't look for what did it mean? Is it a sign? Does that mean I should do this or that? Does that mean that this is somebody special, that this is a special relationship? Let all that go. Just say, okay, it happened. And we'll see what it means, what it might mean in the future. We'll let it play out however it does. So you can be open to meaning for things to happen in the future, but don't feel like there's been any promises or any particular connections. It just is. It happened. Okay. You have the information. Now you, you make your best choice without trying to think that, you know, this is something I should do or something I shouldn't. Isn't that a sign? Isn't that some sort of whatever that will get you in trouble? Just let all that be. If what you feel like, is that you'd like to get to know this guy a little more, then fine, do that. But do it cautiously, being aware, you know, of his level of quality, of how self-centered or how caring he is, whether it's about him or you. So do that all carefully. But don't feel like the big, you know, the great beyond has spoken. You've received a sign and now you're obligated to do something and make the next move. That is not the way it is. <clears throat> Okay. You had an experience. He had an experience. Okay. Now go on with your life and make good choices without reference to that experience. Just say that experience was, it was my experience. And yes, it was real because it's your experience. So the, is it real? Say, yeah, it was real information. That's what I got. Does it mean anything? Who knows? Let the future take care of itself. 
don't you start planning the future of what it meant and what you should do. And if that happened, then I should do this or I'm up. Now you're building a whole structure around it. And all of that is only in your imagination. That structure is what you bring to it. Okay. Out of your fears and needs and wants and all of that. So let the structure be just accept it at face value, what it is without adding anything else. No, it's not a sign. No, it doesn't obligate you to do anything else. No, it doesn't mean the two of you will sail off into the sunset. No, it doesn't mean that he's a monster. It doesn't really mean anything other than it just happened. So mm -hmm. accept that it happened. Make your best choice, not based on it's happening, just your best choice based on your own mind, your own intuition. Take the next step. Always take the next step cautiously. Okay, so that you make good choices cautiously because it's easy to make bad choices. Why is it so easy to make bad choices? Because there are literally a thousand bad choices out there for you to make, but there's usually only one or two or three good choices. See, you got to sort through all of those thousands of bad choices to find the good choice. And will you ever know whether a good choice is a good choice beforehand? Probably not but you will have some sense of where it might go and you will be aware and awake to see how it goes. In other words, don't make plans. Don't, don't feel like the future is being foretold. Deal with the future one frame at a time, one happening at a time. Let it unfold however it is. Don't make a story out of an experience. It's just an experience. It may inform you. It may change your feeling a little bit. Like I do want to talk to this guy again, or, Oh, I really don't want to talk to that guy again. But however you feel, you make that choice and then you have to deal with the consequences of your choices. That's why you always make those choices carefully after thinking about it. So don't make up a story to go with it. Yes, it's real. All information is real. Information comes from three places. Larger consciousness system, some other IUOC, your imagination. There's no tags, which is which. They all look exactly the same. They're all information. That's why you have to always be skeptical of everything. Yes. Don't run off on a fool's errand because you've gotten a sign. You need to make your choices one at a time, what seems best to you at the moment after careful consideration. That's the way you approach life. Stuff happens, you get to deal with it, and by the quality of that choice, you grow up or you, you know, have, you have difficulties. So, yeah, don't make more of it. Don't create a story around it. And Just, why do you think uh, he lost consciousness? I mean, uh, I started to be worried if I do uh, remote healing to people, uh, how I will know if, no, see, now you're making a, now you're trying to make more of it. It just happened. It just was. It was part of the, it, it was part of your experience. It's, he, yeah. it's part of his experience. Don't take, you know, you're not responsible for it. All you did is receive the data. You didn't make it happen. You just received the data. That was the data that came to you. So say, all right, that happened. Don't feel like, oh, you know, what if he fell over and hurt himself? Did I do something awful? You can't think that way or you'll be, you'll put yourself as being responsible for everything that happens in the world. Let that go. It just was the way it was. Okay. He fell over or he didn't fall over. He sat in his chair or the chair moved or it didn't. Doesn't matter. It was an experience. Yes, it was real, but what does it mean? Let that unfold as it unfolds. Don't try to unfold that up. Did you do something that maybe you shouldn't have done? Well, you can think about that, but it sounds like the answer was no. You tried to give the guy a little uh, a hug and some love because he needed it, and you let that happen, and you got all the stuff back. Just accept it. Don't feel like you had responsibility for anything other than you had responsibility for the choice to give him a hug. You felt responsibility for the choice to uh, you know try to help him out. That was your choice. After that, stuff happens. You're not responsible for the stuff that happens. You're only responsible for your choices. 
And you have to look at the consequences of your choices and make decisions based on those as well. So just it was a it, it happened. However, it happened. If he if he suddenly turned upside down and was balanced, you know, on the top of his head on the floor, just say, well, that's interesting. <laughs> that's the way it worked, you know, and don't <laughs> don't put any particular meaning to it. Don't take any responsibility for that. Now, if you try real hard to do something, let's say you tried real hard to turn him upside down on his head because that would be real evidential. All right, that's a different sort of thing. Then you may want to take some responsibility, you know, if all the blood rushes to his head. But if you were just interacting in a loving way, whatever happens, happens. Let it be. You don't have to be responsible for everything. Just let it be the way it is. Let things work out the way they do, one thing at a time. Don't think too much. Just be. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Corinna. Uh, the next question, Tom, comes from Chase K. And I'll read that. My question concerns resolution and how it might have changed over time. Because of limited awareness at the early stages of life in the world and throughout history, could resolution have iteratively, iteratively that's a good word, iteratively gained both clarity and color over time? For example, wolves may be partially colorblind according to research. Is the ability to see quality of resolution dependent on its necessity within quality of consciousness? There have been a lot of talk recently about humans not having a word for the color blue for the longest time of our history, even going so far as to consider blue not existing within our own perception. What are your thoughts on this? I'm not quite sure how he's using the word resolution. There's, right. you, know, you can use the word resolution in several ways. Resolution can be you know, how fine a detail is a picture? You know, what are the, how, how big are the pixels? Resolution, does it all fit together or is it fuzzy? Resolution can also be that a, that a problem resolves itself and there's re resolution to problems. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So if you do, you can, you can maybe give me <laughs> some help there. Um, what would cause, um, a, an inability to distinguish a certain color uh, that might be kind of trying to zero in on the issue that he's describing. Um, what what about our evolution would have affected our ability to discern uh, certain things well, or certain colors at a certain time? Yeah, well, that's just evolution. Now, evolution, I understand in the context of this this question resolution has me a little confused but anyway yes things evolve so evolve you know um wolves who maybe only see in black and white or shades of gray you know there's probably an advantage to them that that's the way it is if indeed that is the way it is then biology would say there's some advantage to the wolf that it is that way and that's why it is that way because that was at least advantageous when it evolved. May, it doesn't mean it's necessarily still advantageous, but it was at the time. Um, same with us and the color spectrum that we see. Okay, we, uh, if let's say we didn't see blue before, but now we do. Let's say that, you know, 100,000 years ago, blue wasn't a color. It's just like ultraviolet is now. Ultraviolet isn't a color for us. The sun has ultraviolet in it, but we don't see it as a color because it's outside of what our our uh, retina and optic nerve can, can deal with. It's outside of the frequency that we interact with. We interact just with the colors, blue through red. So things that's ultra blue or, you know, in the, in the uh, ultraviolet, range blue and violet then uh, that's on one edge and things that are infrared which is lower than what we can see in red that's on the other and as we have a need for those things to have meaning to us to help us survive and procreate then they will change as our environment changes 
So if the environment changes such that our ability to see infrared and say ultraviolet is really important to us, then we will start to develop in that direction because there will be randomly and by intent people who will who will be able to see in those ranges and then if it's a big help surviving and procreating those people who can will start to populate more than those people who can't and eventually everybody will have that ability so that's how evolution works things come and things go things that were very important for our survival and procreation uh over a long period of time often end up in our instincts. Well, those instincts aren't hard written in stone. Those instincts can change as our environment changes. Our instincts need to change to suit, but evolution is slow. Change in environment can be quick. That's part of the problem right now that we have in our social interactions with each other. We have instincts that have gotten kind of out of tune, if you will, with the environment that we live in. We live in a vastly different environment than we did 200,000 years ago. Vastly different. But our instincts were generated from that 200,000 years ago to maybe 100,000 years ago. And we still have those same instincts, even though our environment, our social environment is much, much different. Well, that means we need to understand that not get crosswise with our instincts because that just makes you neurotic if your instincts say one thing and you're doing something else but we need to understand it and start behaving differently start putting on our intentional pressures to change that that instinct and in a few you know three or four or five generations we can actually change instincts it won't take another hundred thousand years but it may take a few generations. We can modify those instincts. So I'm not sure exactly what the question was, but um, you know the color spans that we can see, everything about us physically. You know how how much we can. How good is our smelling? How good is our hearing? Taste. All of our senses can get better or get worse based on what is useful to us useful in the terms of survival and procreation. In our present environment, so many threats have been eliminated. Our environment is kind of plain vanilla, not all that scary as it used to be. So things will change, no doubt, since our environment has changed. A lot of social behavior will have to change because our environment has changed. But that will take generations. Maybe in time we will be able to see ultraviolet and infrared because it'll become very important to us, but probably won't happen quickly. It may happen over a century or, or two though, but for everybody to get there, it probably will be a millennia. So I'm not sure I've answered this question because I really didn't understand it, but, uh, that's my best shot. All right, Tom. I I'm, I'm, hope that's good and hope that did answer your question, Chase. If not, we'll rephrase it and try it again. Uh, the next question is from Dave C. And in, he says, in short, my situation is several years ago, my wife became ill. We think she's bipolar, but not sure. She became out of control, depressed, crying, angry, and violent. She ended up getting arrested and having to get a place of her own, though we are still married. This happened shortly after my son was born. He's only four and a half now. Because of all this, the finances are in ruin, and I'm pretty much raising my son on my own. Also, as a result of this, I'm in a lot of debt. To overcome some of these obstacles and issues, I decided to go to school to become a physical therapist assistant. Unfortunately, this didn't work out, 
as it was not possible to work and to be in the program. So I've been trying to figure out a way around that issue. In the meantime, I recently passed out at the wheel and hit a telephone pole. Since then, I've had a bunch of dizzy and fainting spells. Tests have been done over the past week or so, and now I'm waiting to get results back. So it seems like, as I'm sure in the case with many people, so maybe nothing notable or nothing unusual at all, I keep hitting block after block. A mutual friend has suggested that I request that I ask you to take a look to see if you can gain any insight into my situation, the health issues in particular, I think, to see what is going on and if any sort of healing can be done to remedy the issue or issues and also possibly to get some understanding of the situation in general. Things have sort of limped along like this for many years, most of my life, frankly, and I've yet to find a solution, at least for the external issues. Otherwise, it has and continues to be um, training, great training in many ways, and in that way, I'm grateful and fortunate enough to still be happy and content through it all. My understanding is stuff happens, and I get to deal with it, preferably in whatever way best serves or is in accordance with the ideal that is being love, reducing fear and thereby ego, being of service, etc. I've been a student of Vedanta and yoga for many years and those things seem to parallel MBT in this and other ways. So at least insofar as I understand, it doesn't really matter what happens, is happening or has happened, but rather how I respond to it that matters most. In other words, face it all with courage. Be love and grow uh, things. And I'm concerned for my son if something should happen to me, even if intellectually I can appreciate that even ultimately it isn't of any real consequence exactly when considering a big picture view. That attachment is particularly a difficult one to let go of. So I'm asking for a little bit of assistance and insight and whatever you can offer it for advice. Well, that's an interesting question. It starts out with a question and then provides its own answer. Um, <laughs> all of the things, you know, the first half kind of defined the problem. The second half uh, was very, very good at explaining, uh, you know, how one, you know, the dealing with it, you know, and he actually says that though because he has, uh, uh, you know, grown up a lot, he has been able to persevere and remain, remain, basically happy and uh, functional through all of this. And he's learning and growing from it. And for that, he's thankful. Well, there's not a whole lot to add to that. You're doing really great guy. You have, uh, you know, you have a lot of challenges in your life, but it sounds like you are rising to each one of those challenges as they happen. You're growing. And I suspect this is going to be one of your most profitable, uh, you know, experience packets. It sounds like you have met, you know, one challenge after another, after another. You understand the big picture. You're making good choices. You're doing the best you can. And that's really all any of us can do. So I'd say it sounds like a hugely successful incarnation. You see, we don't it's judge supposed- how good our, how good our incarnation is based on how, you know, how much beer we've drank and how many parties we've gone to and how much fun we've had. We judge the success of our incarnation by how much we've grown up. And it sounds like, uh, you know, you've been uh, kind of kicked a lot, but each time you've learned from it. So it sounds to me like it's a great success story. Yes, a lot of things have happened, and um, you seem to deal with them one at a time, and life has been difficult, but you're concerned about your son. but as a low entropy consciousness, you will give that your son lots of love, lots of caring, lots of understanding, and he will be advantaged, not disadvantaged, no matter how long he gets to stay in that situation. It will be an advantage to him, you see? So if something happens to you next week, he will be advantaged that he got to live with you, this love, this caring, this big picture, for as long as he did. So he's already advantaged. And the more time he spends with you, the more advantaged he will be. But he has the same mission that you do. And that is the stuff is going to happen to him and he needs to deal with it. And you are giving him a great example for how to deal with it. So I'd say carry on. You're doing well. 
Sounds like your incarnation is a very successful one. And uh, keep making those good decisions based on that big picture. Deal with it, with the, with the decision, you know, with choices that are the best choices you can make for everybody. It's not just best choices for you, but the best choices for the system, for everyone that connects with you. So, uh, um, you know, it sounds like a success story to me. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. It obviously works very well and you're learning a lot. Now, for those people that uh, kind of been, you know, left behind, like, like the wife who sounds like she had the, uh, the uh, postpartum blues and wasn't able to shake it. Um, that happens sometimes. Sometimes they recover in weeks. Sometimes they don't recover. You know, it's just a, has a lot to do with biology. It's just the way things work out. So all you can do there is just in your mind, in your intent, send all those people love. Send all those people caring, all the people that seem to have dropped by the wayside as you've gone through this this troubled life. Um, you know, send them love. That's about all that you can do there. See what you can do to help them, to connect with them. Uh, but if they're just, you know, the brain chemistry is such that it's been years and years now, well, that's a lot likely to change. If it was only weeks, I'd say you got a high probability that that will change. But if it's been years and years, you've got a low probability that that will change. You might make that probability bigger by sending healing energy and that sort of thing. But uh, live your own life. Make your choices. You don't need any advice from me. You're already doing it all right in very difficult circumstances. So, uh, you know, good for you. Keep up the good work. All right. Thank you, Tom. I think that uh, it seems he, he was handling everything with a really good attitude. Probably he wanted some insight into possibly a reason why all these blocks are coming up for him. Um, well, that would, Don, it would be a question that's really not a good question to ask. Why do these blocks, you know, why do things happen to me with the way they do? Well, just start with the attitude that they do. Stuff happens, you get to deal with it. The why is really not important. It's happened. You know, maybe he's a an evolved entity that really wanted some challenges because you grow more from challenges than you do from no challenges. So maybe this has just been set up to, you know, to help him grow. Who knows? Maybe not. Maybe it's just been the luck of the draw when you all those possibilities and that random draw is taken from the probability distribution of possibilities, and that's just how they turned out. You see, there may not be any plan at all. So if you start trying to figure out why, why me, you're asking the wrong question. That's really about you. That's a question that's pointing inward to to me. Best just to accept it as it comes, deal with it, and learn from it. Okay. That's Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Why me I, is not really a good question. It doesn't matter. It just is. Accept it as it is. The why me is kind of a self centered viewpoint. I'm not sure that was his phrasing. It was it possibly my interpretation of it, but I think yeah. the insight that you gave just now is probably exactly what he's looking for, even though he is handling everything perfectly. There was that Huh, is there a bigger is there a bigger picture to this? And I think he meant it in the in the best possible way. Okay. All right. Well, we'll if did you have anything to add to that, Tom? No. no That's good. No. All right. So let's move on. And I understand Greg has a question that was submitted, and I missed that because you must have submitted it. Um, a little bit later, but that's all right. Go ahead, Greg, and ask your question. Yeah, I, I submitted my question later. The new rules say to submit it, but sorry about that. Um, my question was, uh, so I was actually on here a few months ago saying how I was feeling kind of unchallenged and like not a lot was happening. And it was uh, very soon after that that a lot happened. <laughs> 
to me quickly, uh, giving me opportunities to grow. And, you know, that all appears to me to be really, you know, good that that happened, giving me opportunities. Um, but this interesting pattern has come out of that where um, a situation will come up that's like a challenge and I can go into this mode where I'll I can feel some fear about it. And then the fear will get like really, 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 really big, like more than I like seems like I've ever felt. And then I'll like process through that and then it'll go completely away. And that might take, you know, that might be like a day. And then it feels like it's gone after that day has passed. And so I'm like, well, I guess that's good that I like process through that like so quickly or something, but it's mm -hmm. also, it's very like disruptive and, uh, um, I, I guess another metaphor would be like, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm drilling deeper into levels of subconscious or whatever. And then when I hit another pocket of fear, it all just like blasts out all at once. And it's, again, it's like, it's good that it goes quickly, but it's, it's bad that it is, um, like for that time, it just seems terrible. And it, it's, it's got me almost feeling, I'm realizing that it's got me feeling some trepidation about like trying to push and grow more because I'm like afraid of it. <laughs> these little landmines, even if they do go quickly, because during the time they are, it's so, so anyway, I, I thought that was interesting because that didn't, that didn't really seem to happen to me until like, you know, the last several months. And I was wondering why that is. And well, the reason why all this happened is because you expressed an intent for something to happen. You felt like you were just kind of drifting and not a lot was happening. And you said, well, okay, let's, you know, let's get on with this. I need to grow up. Uh, um, and when you ask for challenges, sometimes you be, you need to be careful what you ask for. And if it's kind of an open, uh, you know, a blank check that I uh, just want to grow up, the system will oblige you. But you seem to have a, um, you know, you've worked out a system, a tool for getting rid of these fears. And that is you recognize them then you own them and you just experience them intensely. That's when the fear is completely, you know, overwhelming. And after you experience it intensely, you say, all right, don't need that anymore. And poof, it goes away. Now, if they stay away and don't come back and don't reappear, I'd say that's a hugely valuable tool. And you shouldn't wish for it to go away or for them to stop happening. You should say, okay, however many of those landmines that are in there, let me jump on them. Let me explode them. But let me not do it, you know, while I'm driving my race car, you know, you know, around sharp bends. Let me do it on the weekends. Takes a day. Let's, let's do that on Saturdays or, or uh, Sundays or on my day off. And then I'll be all right. You know, because if that happens in the middle of your work day, it could be a problem. So as long as you can control kind of when it comes up, wow, great tool. Keep using it until all those landmines have been exploded and you've gotten rid of all of them. That's terrific. If you can't control it and it just happens to you, well, it's still a good thing. It's still a great tool. You just have to know when it's coming on and you go to the boss and say, boss, I'm going to have to leave today. I'm not feeling very good. And you take a day of sick leave and you go home and have your fear thing and get over it because that's more important to the rest of your life than that day at work. So if you're out with friends, you can say, excuse me, I'm just not feeling too good. I need to leave now. Well, go home and have your thing. But if you can control it, you can put it where you want it. If you can't, Make the best excuses you can and go someplace where you can work through it. Because getting rid of those fears, if that's what's going on, if you really do get rid of it, wow, what a tool. Most people uh, would love to have a tool that way, even if it's a mildly inconvenient sometimes. So uh, I know it's scary and trouble at the top when the whole thing blows up in your face, but that's good if then you just exit it. All right, I've been there. I've done it. That's, you know, that's the fear. Well, what happens is once you've, once you tell your fear, give me your best shot. And it does. You can then say, is that all? Is that all you've got? And then it's gone. You've just pulled all the teeth out of your fear. You can, okay. Yeah, it was big and scary for a while, but it's not a, you know, it's, it's not running my life. I don't need this thing. 
and you can let go of it. So that's one of the ways, that's one of the tools you use to get rid of your fear. You just ask it, you know, give me your best shot fear, you know. I'm, I'm not going to make choices based on you anymore. And if that causes, you know, some terrible monster to show up and, you know, with big teeth, do it. All right, you know, bite me, kill me. What are you going to do to me? Whatever it is you can do, do it now. And you call it bluff, you call it out, and you find out it can't do anything to you. It can just make you in this big fear cloud that lasts for a day, and that's all it can do. Well, that's not much. That's just a lot of smoke, you see. And then that gives you the strength to get rid of the next one because none of these fears are usually much more than smoke. So you got a tool. Yeah, use it. That's what happens when yeah. you say, okay, system, I'm ready. Sock it to me. <laughs> Things like this happen. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and I was also curious about how I could potentially uh, use this with like an NPMR sense. Um, because, because since this is happening, my kind of my dreams or meditation or anything I try to do with NPMR, it's been like much less useful and like much less there than there was before this and um i think what might be happening is is that i have this sense that well if i go into the this npm power zone these land these landmines could really be there and uh it's like there's some level of like being a little like afraid of the fear you know afraid of hitting those in npmr but do you think that possibly if i could you know, get over that and set the intent to go to, you know, go into my dreams or go into meditation to find and hit some of these that I could get rid of them there instead of having to like wait for them and, and, you know, just whenever they show up in physical life. Yeah, that's, it's possible. You know, it depends. You might try that. And if it works out, then do more of it. If it doesn't work out, then go back, but you got a tool that's working, work with it, you know, work it, use it. If it's, you got something that's, that's being useful, then I do it. If you think you can make it more efficient or better, give it a try. If not, hang on to what you got. So yeah, you can okay. try that, but uh, if, if it doesn't work, then just keep doing it the way you're doing it. If it does work, you just need, now that you've seen some of these fears just come and turn into smoke and disappear, you should know that there are, all your fears are like that. <laughs> So uh, that's what's going to happen. They blow up and they're a big, you know, big paper tiger and the paper tiger looks really, really scary. And then it just kind of flops to the floor because it's just paper. And that's, that's what's going to happen, whether it's here or there. So get your courage and just say, I'll deal with these things. I'm getting rid of them. Or maybe you keep dealing with them the way you're doing until some of them are gone. And then you go into the non-physical where you can deal with maybe the the last ones. Who knows? Maybe the last ones are the big ones. Maybe you've already done the big ones and the last ones will be easy. You won't know until you do it. But all in all, it takes courage. And by the way, I like your beard and mustache. It looks really good. It took me a while before I realized that you were the same Greg P that comes here a lot because the first time I've seen you with the beard, yeah, and from a guy who's had a beard since he was 20, you know, uh, yeah, my, my wife and children have never seen my face, you know, didn't have a beard on it. So, uh, yeah, I like it. Thanks, Tom. Yes, you got a, go a vote from me too. All right. Uh, let's, we'll be on to the next question then. Uh, Carolyn L is listening in, but I'm going to read her question for her. Since most of humanity have or had troubles with their teeth, I wanted to know what Tom's point of view on modern dental care is. Fluoride is a very controversial substance, and a lot of naturalists believe that cavities can cure themselves or be prevented by them, themselves by the right diet. No processed food. Since Tom is also mainly living on raw food diet, I would like to know about his experiences. Okay, well, there's a lot of variables here. One is that some people are born with a lot, let's say, cav a lot more cavity resistant than others. And often we say that in terms of metaphors of some people's teeth are hard and other people's teeth are soft. 
So that's just part of the way biology works. So there's a difference. Some people are very cavity, cavity prone and others almost never get a cavity. Okay. The best thing you can do for yourself as far as dental health goes is to keep the sugar out of your mouth all the time. You know, cut down on your carbohydrates and don't eat those, those uh, sticky sweet things that get stuck between teeth and in gums and just sit there incubating bacteria because bacteria grows in sugar really, really well. So, or if you must indulge in those things right after you're done swallowing, go rinse your mouth out with warm water three or four times and try to get that, you know, hot water. If you have it, you know, get that sugar to melt and swish out with the water. So the reason we have so much tooth decay in the land today is because we have so much sugar in the land today and so many forms that that sugar takes. You know, you feed your children gummy bears and your children are going to have lots of cavities. Now, if your child has teeth enamel is soft, they're going to have lots and lots of cavities. It's just, if their enamel is hard, they'll have just a few cavities, but they're going to have cavities if you feed them gummy bears because that's the kind of sticky stuff that stays, you know, between your teeth and gets under your gums and that kind of stuff. So if you can the sweet stuff, and that includes a lot of juice, you know, fruit is fine. If you take, uh, you know, if you take a lot of something and make a concentrated juice, which is generally what they do because sweet sells and to make your juice sell, you make it sweet. So it's not just the juice that you would get if you bit a, an apple. That's not what you get for apple juice. You get something that is a lot more concentrated than just the juice in an apple in apple juice. Because if you just got the juice in an apple, people would buy something else. They'd say, oh, that's not as good as the competitor who puts a lot of high fructose corn syrup in their apple juice or uses a hundred apples to make one glass of juice. And they evaporate the water out of it, which makes the sweetness more and more concentrated. So sweet cells, most everything you eat has sugar in it. Even the things that you think don't have sugar in it probably do. There's very few items that you can buy uh, that don't have sugar in them. But uh, I'd say that's the key thing. It's what you eat. It's the oral hygiene you have. If you must eat the stuff that creates decay, then rinse your mouth out afterwards. Brush your teeth often, you know, that sort of thing. Um, whether you get a, a, a um, cavity or not has a lot of uncertainty to it. There's a lot of things going on that nobody notices going on that are all uncertain until the cavity pops up. Here's where your intent can be very helpful because there's a lot of uncertainty. Your intent can modify those results. So if the probability that you're going to get a cavity is say 70%, well, you're going to get a lot of cavities, but if you use your intent to lower that to 30%, you won't get so many. So a good attitude is another thing. If you have the idea that, oh, cavities, everybody gets cavities, nothing you can do about cavities, well, that will help make cavities. Or if you're afraid of them, oh, no, I don't want any cavities, that fear will help make cavities. A good positive attitude toward being healthy and toward eating properly and good oral hygiene will take you as far as you can go. As far as chemicals and things that will harden your teeth, it's hard to know where the truth is. You have propagandists on both sides making claims and you know good for you if you can uh, if you can uh, figure out the truth in all of that well i don't think most people really know what the truth is in all of that the original fluoride got put in water because people that had that in their water didn't get as many cavities as people didn't have that in their water but who knows too much fluoride we know isn't good for you either Actually, you put too much fluoride on your teeth and you end up with getting more cavities, not less. So like everything else, uh, you can, you can, you can overdose. You can get too much to where it's unhealthy. Fluoride is something that's naturally in a lot of water. Um, the, the health risks of it. Yes. I've read both sides of the, in, you know, in the propaganda wars. And, uh, I think it's very difficult these days because there's so much fear in the land. It's very difficult to find the truth in anything.
just by searching the literature. The literature is so full of fearful people writing about their fears that it's very difficult to sort that out from good science. And sometimes good science uh, isn't really good science. You know, it depends on who does it and who pays for it and a lot of other things. So do your best to, you know, to, to read up on it. But if you're like me, you'll probably have a hard time finding exactly where the truth lies in that argument. Meanwhile, good hygiene, good attitude, good intentions. Let the sugar go, and uh, you'll find that your mind as well as your teeth will thank you.